Um, the view from this building is brilliant. I don't know if, um, if you get a chance to go right up to the top. Um, Imran took some pictures from the top of this building, and that was what really sold me on coming and doing this event, because from the top floor of this building, you can see right across the city, and you can see so many of the things that inspired me in my work. The American architect, Hugh Newell Jacobson, said, when you look at a city, it's like reading the hopes, aspirations, and pride of everyone who built it. And it really is like that when you look out of the windows of this building. Um, I'm Matt Edgar, and I studied history at university. So I was looking at stories about the past, and then I became a newspaper journalist telling stories about the present day. And then I moved into new media. I came to Leeds to work uh, in new media about 10, 15 years ago, thinking a lot about the future, about what te technology was going to do for us. But I've always found it incredibly inspiring to be doing that work in a city that has such a rich industrial past. Um, there are very few cities in the world that can claim to have been an industrial city for 200 years. If you look at the new cities springing up in China, in, in Asia, in South America, in Africa, they have 200 years to wait until they have that accumulation of stories built up from people working and living and doing stuff together in cities. And so everything that we do, I think, can be inspired and infused by this stuff. Um, stuff like... I'm going backwards, going forwards. Stuff like down there, it's a bit pixelated, you can't quite see it, but there's Quarry House there. Um, there's a flat iron building in front of it. And just down there is Leeds Bridge. You can't see Leeds Bridge, you can just see in that direction. Um, but that's the place where this man, Louis Le Prince, shot some of the world's first movies. Um, Louis Le Prince and his wife, Lizzie, who I don't think gets enough credit for this, Lizzie Le Prince was from Leeds, from a family called the Whiteleys, who had a brass foundry in Leeds. She trained as a potter in Paris around uh, the 1870s and 80s, I guess, um, where she met Louis, and she brought Louis back to Leeds to come and work in the family business. And together, Louis and Lizzie Le Prince founded, in Park Row, a school of the technical arts. And what they were interested in was the technology of art, all the things in the... the ceramics, um, in brass, all of the things, that the scientific skills and knowledge that was rapidly advancing in order to make amazing decorative objects and make arts. And I, and I think that combination of the science and the arts together is something that Leeds has always had in spades. We think of new media today as something about bits and bytes, as something digital. I think in the late Victorian era, new media was chemistry. New media was the action of chemicals, light, paper, celluloid. That was the new media of the day. And Louis Le Prince was one of several people around the world who were trying to combine that power of photography, this new art of photography that had been around for a while, and make it move, make, bring it to life, um, which he did spectacularly. Um, the, if you go to the Internet Movie Database and look up the year 1888... There are three films, and they're all by Louis Le Prince. Um, Traffic Moving Across Leeds Bridge is one of them. Um, if you look up 1887, there are no movies. Um, Louis Le Prince is the, the world's first motion picture maker. Um, but in order to do that, he needed two things. He needed a camera and a projector, and actually Le Prince's camera and projector were the same machine. It could do both. But in order to move the the pictures, the frames, through the gate of the camera projector, he needed a mechanism to move things on. And he turned to someone else, another inventor from Leeds, who made something that every city needs, a machine for dispensing tickets. Think of all those football matches, theatre performances, the need for mass, uh, a mass of people needing to know whether they're allowed in or out of events. Tickets, a machine that can turn out tickets quickly, quickly, quickly. That's exactly the machine that you need to take pictures, pictures, pictures in a hurry and make a moving picture camera. So Louis Le Prince combined his invention with the invention of James Longley. And James Longley built the machine that Le Prince used to make those pictures. That combination of ideas, the fact that in a city you get 
lots of people with lots of different ideas pressed together. They talk amongst themselves. They combine things. Um, that, I think, is the real power of this city. And that's why um, moving pictures happen for the first time in a city. Um, and when I see the Leeds Savages Club of writers and artists talking to the guys from the Leeds Hack Space, when you see the things that go on at Temple Works, I think there's that real combination of stuff that makes this place so vibrant. Um, just down the road, there, there are the pictures, by the way. Um, traffic moving across Leeds Bridge, second moving picture of all time. Um, just down the road is Meadow Lane, where Joseph Priestley moved when he came to Leeds. Joseph Priestley was a radical minister. He moved to Leeds... Um, and the house that they prepared for him wasn't ready, so they put him in kind of temporary lodgings on Meadow Lane next door to a brewery. It's not the same brewery that's there today. That's its chimney today. It's not the same brewery, but it was a brewery very near that site of uh, a company called Jakes and Nell. And Joseph Priestley wandered around the brewery and he noticed bubbles coming off the vats of beer, and he wondered what was in those bubbles. And that set him on a train of experiments which led to him isolating the gas that we know today as oxygen. Joseph Priestley was the kind of guy who liked to share things. He was always talking about stuff. He frequented coffee houses in London and other cities. Um, one of his friends was a chap called Benjamin Franklin, who you may have heard of, uh, a founder of, of the United States. And when, when Joseph Priestley told his friend Benjamin Franklin, when he told his friend Benjamin Franklin about this uh, this discovery and how plants appeared to create this gas and animals appeared to consume it, Ben Franklin said, maybe we should stop chopping down so many trees, which I thought was an amazing inspiration. A little mint plant somewhere on the kitchen worktop in Joseph Priestley's house at the, in Leeds, um, leading to that insight and the, the interdependence of our ecosystem and our green movement. Joseph Priestley also invented a method for making carbonated drinks, fizzy pop. Joseph Priestley, the father of fizzy drinks, he open-sourced the method, and a chap called Johann Schwepp cleaned up on that one. <laughs> um, you can read more about that. The, the, the American writer Stephen Johnson has written a brilliant biography of Joseph Priestley, um, and also now a very relevant book to the stuff we're talking about, where good ideas come from. But I want to talk about Someone else who thought about where good ideas come from, Charles Ledbetter, uh, who was asked to speak in Shanghai about what it takes to make a city a platform for innovation. Why, why are some cities innovative and some not? And he came up with what he called six Cs. You can tell he's a consultant. He has six Cs. Um, but they're quite relevant to what we're talking about today. This combination, the ability to join stuff together, um, Louis Le Prince and James Longley combining their ideas to make something new. Conversation, um, Joseph Priestley chatting with Ben Franklin, sharing his ideas. Um, Co-evolution, the ability for um, customers, suppliers, manufacturers, the whole value chain to develop new ideas together for things to... Um, you know, for a whole market to grow from nothing in a city and evolve together. Challenge, the fact that if you have it too easy, you never get anything done. People need to have some kind of obstacles, some challenges, and cities can be challenging places to live. Leeds in the Industrial Revolution, I think, certainly was a challenging place to live. Um, and then connection, the fact that a city needs to be connected to the outside world. It can't just be innovating alone in isolation. Um, so, I've got examples of all of those C's, really, from around this city. Let's go over and look at Tower Works. Three towers. There's um, Florence, Verona, Tuscan Hill Village. Um, but what's really interesting about Tower Works is not the, the amazing towers. It's what happened in it. Colonel Thomas Harding was a manufacturer of pins... And when I say pins, I don't mean dressmaker's pins. I mean the pins that are used in the textile industry. If you have ever looked at machines that were used for weaving, spinning, all sorts of different textile processes, they're covered in pins because the pins root the 
little fibres of fabric, the threads from one bit of the process to another. Pins used by the billion. And what Thomas Harding, the manufacturer of those pins, understood was that if his company made pins and other companies made pins and every, every customer needed pins, it would help if they came in some kind of standard sizes. So Thomas Harding collaborated, he co-evolved, he worked with his customers and his competitors to create a standard set of pin sizes for the textile manufacturer. And pins around the world for the best part of a century were used in the Harding gauge, named after Colonel Harding of Tower Works. Um, and I kind of think that idea of standardisation, the ability to be open and say everyone should be making the same thing. For me, when I think about the Harding gauge, I think of those pins as like kind of angle brackets in code. I think of the Harding gauge like this. The Harding gauge was the, the HTML, the open data that allowed the textile business to flourish and evolve and develop. Um, and you see that too in the other great natural resource that Yorkshire and the north of England, of course, was sitting on in the Industrial Revolution, coal. It's no coincidence that the first steam engines were built for coal mines because coal mines have plenty of coal. They had this stuff lying around. They could experiment and um, co-evolve the use of steam power. So let's think about steam power just down there. It's down there, right? If you get a chance to look out the window, you can see over to the Round Foundry and to Marshall's Mill and, Temp and Temple Works over that way. Just down there is Matthew Murray's Round Foundry. And it's not round anymore. There used to be a Round Foundry there. If you walk around it, the footings of the Round Foundry can still be seen. But now there's a square building there. Um, on the place where the Round Foundry used to be, uh, Matthew Murray uh, built possibly the world's first integrated engineering works. He was making steam engines for all of those mills, and latterly for transport as well. But he certainly faced challenge. Remember that sea, the sea of challenge. Um, James Watt, a much bigger name in the Industrial Revolution, um, was jealous of Murray's success. He sent spies to work inside Matthew Murray's works. He stole Murray's ideas. He got Murray drunk and stole his ideas. Um, and he bought up land around the Round Foundry in order to stop Murray expanding his business. It was certainly a challenging time. I've written a bit more about that in that newspaper that some of you will have picked up tonight. I'm going to be talking a bit more about that at Interesting North on Saturday as well, if anyone's going to that. Um, but the challenge didn't put Matthew Murray off. He went on to build the Salamanca over at Middleton, somewhere over there, over there. Um, it's a steam engine. It's the world's first commercially successful steam engine, pulling truckloads of coal from the Middleton colliery outside Leeds into Leeds city centre, where all those mills and manufacturers are going to use it to make more stuff. Um, that's what the Industrial Revolution was all about. Let's think about those mills. Um, back over there next to, next to the Round Foundry is Marshall's Mill. Um, I used to work there at Orange, and working there was one of the things that really got me inspired about this stuff. Because Marshall's Mill was owned by a chap called John Marshall, who also built, built Temple Works. Um, he, he faced another kind of a challenge, because when one of John Marshall's mills burnt down, um, flax spinning, he, he spun flax into thread. Flax spinning was a very flammable process. It tended to be carried on in wooden framed buildings which caught fire easily. There were a lot of these fires. But when one of John Marshall's mills burned down, he partnered with someone who had a different way of building mills. And Marshall's mill there is, I think, one of the first fireproof mills. Uh, they were constructed of cast iron frames with brick. They didn't burn down. But the other thing is that once you start building with a metal frame, you're really on the way to inventing a skyscraper. So when you look at Old Broadcasting House, the best new tall building of 2010. Um, you can really link it back to the fireproof mills that were created in Yorkshire and the north of England back in the Industrial Revolution. They were set on a path there that was going to go ever upwards. And across that city, looking out of that view, there are so many other things I could tell you about. I could tell you about Marks and Spencers from uh, Leeds Market, the Penny Bazaar that turned into 
the chain of department stores. I could tell you about Burton's who kitted out virtually every demobbed soldier after the Second World War with a civilian suit, about FreeServe, the company that made internet access a reality for millions of people in this country by changing the business model. Some amazing stuff that was invented and developed in Leeds. But sometimes it kind of runs out, um, and we have to ask ourselves what's left. This is the St. Aidan's walking drag line. Um, a while ago, this was an open-cost coal mine, and now it's been kind of remediated. It's been put back into some mythical sort of Teletubby land status where there's rolling grassland and lakes, and in the middle of it, this five-storey high monster digger that used to walk across the landscape. And the landscape has changed, but the digger's still there. Um, and we've got all these things now that are there, just memories. And you know, some people probably want to get rid of them. Some people say, well, what's the point of having this stuff, these relics? But I think it's really important to have this stuff because I think those relics, those stories are the things out of which we're going to make the future. They're the stories on which we can build to create new stuff. And I've seen that theme um, coming out, listening to Susan, about the importance of listening to people's stories, listening to Megan, and inspired by the stories that she's picked up along the way, helping people to tell their stories. I think of this stuff as narrative capital. It's the store of the, the wealth of stories that you build up, the power to tell stories about your places, your lives are really important. And the more people know about the amazing things that have happened in the past in this city, the more they might have a chance of doing something with them. Um, so it's about memory, it's about stories, and stories that belong to everyone. Let's look over here in Temple Works. That's the inside of Temple Works. You know what the outside looks like, um, big Egyptian thing. Inside... Susan said, largest room in the world. Inside the largest room in the world worked thousands of women. Thousands of women, um, probably some children too. They were kind to the children there. They let them go to Sunday school on a Sunday. Um, but every one of those people too had stories to tell, which is just as important as the stories about the dead white men, the great inventors, um, which I think we should hold on to as well. Um, and those stories, the very human stories, are important because sometimes if you try and grab too much onto the heroes, onto the, the famous names, you find that their stories are a bit slippery. Um, you know, Louis Le Prince, an amazing story we should celebrate. Louis Le Prince was a Frenchman and he had to go to New York to commercialise his invention. Um, Joseph Priestley was from Leeds, but he did a lot of his important work in Birmingham and ended his life in exile in the United States. Um, Matthew Murray, great Leeds inventor, was from Newcastle, and the North East has as much claim on him as we do. So we can, we can use stories, but we can't own them. We can't exclusively own those stories. Um, and there's James Watt. Um, City Square in Leeds, there's a statue of James Watt. Someone thought that that was an important story for Leeds. We all know, because we know the story of Matthew Murray, that James Watt is the last person who should be in City Square in the middle of Leeds. <laughs> but um, stories sometimes end up in the wrong place. Um, and I, it, it worries me, but it doesn't bother me too much. Because when I look at the amazing places that we've got around this city, when you look at the um, Temple of Horus at Edfu, just down there on um, Marshall Street, and... The, um, the bell tower of Florence, just over on Water Lane, and the uh, Venetian Palazzo on Park Square, and the uh, Parisian Bourse de Commerce that Cuthbert Broderick gave us for the Corn Exchange, you can see that the people who built Leeds in the Victorian era had a real sense of connection to the rest of the world. They were outward-looking. They didn't... Um, they, they wouldn't have settled for Leeds being the best city in the UK. They thought of Leeds as being equal to any city anywhere in recorded history. They could be ancient Egypt. They could be Renaissance Italy. Um, and they were comfortable with that because they, they uh, were comfortable with their place in the world. I think we could learn a little bit from that. So I want to conclude with some words 
from Jane Jacobs, uh, the American campaigner and writer, about the role of cities and, and where regeneration comes from. She said, lively, diverse, intense cities contain the seeds of their own regeneration with energy enough to carry over for problems and needs outside themselves. And I think that that duality is really important to us. We can solve our problems. We've got this amazing wealth of stories and of people and skills working today to solve our own problems. And when we do, we find that we have energy enough to carry over and start helping people all over the rest of the world as well. I hope some of those stories inspire you as much as they inspire me. Thank you. Thank you.